Are you looking for truth from God's Word that you can understand and apply to your life? You'll find it today on Make It Clear with Dr. Stan Pons, Bible teacher and president of Florida Bible College in beautiful Orlando. Listen now as Stan makes it clear. Hi, my name is Stan Pons, and I'm the host of Make It Clear and the president of Florida Bible College in beautiful Orlando, Florida. Thank you for listening to the daily Bible teaching here on Make It Clear. From time to time, I want to bring to you Bible teachers and friends from seasons of yesterday and today who had a great influence in my life, hoping they'll add value to yours as they did mine. Well, today's guest Bible teacher and author is Dr. Mark G. Cameron. As a young boy, he came to faith in Christ through the ministry of Billy Sunday, and then later in life, he worked side by side with W.B. Riley and the Northwestern Bible Schools in Minneapolis, and then with Lee Roberson at Tennessee Temple in Chattanooga. Then Dr. Cameron became the vice president of Florida Bible College when it began in 1962. Did you know he was one of the most popular Bible teachers at Florida Bible College because of his love for Jesus Christ, his love for the Word of God, his love for Jewish people, founding Seaside Mission to Jewish people in Miami, and of course to all of us as students. We'll never forget his love for his beloved wife, Miss Mary. I learned Bible doctrines and hermeneutics from this class at Florida Bible College and from his books. And today, my friends, I am happy to have you listen to one of his past messages, and hopefully you'll be as blessed from it as I was. But here's my guest today, Dr. Mark G. Cameron. We have a word of prayer before we begin. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that we have found in the Lord Jesus Christ our Passover slain for us, that as therefore the Passover slain, and the blood caught, then applied to the doorpost and the top post of the home. Therefore, we by faith have taken the hyssop of faith and dipped it into the precious blood of Jesus and applied it to the doorpost of our home, our hearts. And therefore, O Heavenly Father, thou hast said this, that I, Jehovah, when I see the blood, I will pass over thee. And we are so thankful, Lord, thou hast seen by faith that we believe that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died for us, and that he rose again, and therefore the blood is applied to our hearts, and thou hast said, I see no judgment. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. You have said, when I see the blood, I passed over, over in judgment. Thank you, Lord, for what even this service for 3,500 years have meant. May we take just a little glimpse of what happened when our Lord observed it. And may this be something for us to remember, even as we observe the Lord's Supper at every time. For Jesus' sake, amen. Now, we will explain every little thing here as we begin going. But we find that over here in Exodus, we know the story very well where Jehovah therefore turned to Moses and then to the children of Israel, what was going to happen? Now, there have been already nine great plagues put upon the Egyptians. We find this, that every plague was a direct attack of one of the Egyptians' gods. And remember, Israel was not worshiping Jehovah, not for many years. They were worshiping the gods of the Egyptians. So we find out such as this, They worshiped the Nile River, God turned it to blood. They worshiped the sun, God turned it to sackcloth. They worshiped the frogs, God gave them the deluge of frogs. Whatever they had, they worshiped the cow, God put murine upon the cow. They worshiped the grain, God therefore had the hail to destroy it. So you find out that all these nine plagues before were therefore the direct thrust of God against the gods of the Egyptians. Now this last plague, we find out, was therefore against the firstborn of man and a beast. We find this, that the Egyptians believed that the firstborn of animal, as well as man, had a little spark of divinity in them, and they were sacred more than any other part of the family. So God is going to take the firstborn. It was a strenuous night. Israel knew now that indeed Jehovah was showing his power. We do know that there were Janus and Jambres, these These men who had uh, gone ahead and done the same things like uh, Aaron had done. But on some of these plagues, they could not go ahead and duplicate it. So then, therefore, they knew that God was doing it. 
the advisors of Pharaoh said, let them go. But God says, I'm going to harden his heart. Not that he'd go to hell, but he was already an instrument already and deserving death and destruction. But God is going to use him and selecting him and electing him for this service. Therefore, to harden his heart that he, God Almighty, would give one more, one more, one more judgment upon Israel. This was a terrible time. It's at night. They had all day long to prepare for it and to cook the Passover lamb. And we are told by the word that God says this night, when you observe it, not a dog shall bark in all the land of Goshen. Think of it. What a stillness there was when the children of Israel ate it. God says, I want you to eat it now and eat it with unleavened bread. Leaven, as we do know, means sin. Unleavened means sinlessness. I want you to eat this. I want you, therefore, have uh, your girdle around you. I want you to have sandals on your feet. I want you to have a staff in your hand. You're on your way out of Egypt. As Lord Jesus Christ is our Passover slain for us, certainly we're not to remain dormant. We're not to stay in Egypt, but we are to get out. And we are to go. We have our traveling orders. Therefore, if we are buried with him in the likeness of his death, baptism, and raised in the likeness of his resurrection, to walk in newness of life. We are on our way now to the promised land of Christian maturity, but we do know there is the, uh, uh, the ocean, the gulf, therefore to the Red Sea to pass through. We know there is a wilderness at least two years to go. God said this. He could have led them by the way of Philistia into the promised land three days, which would have been much nearer, but he was afraid that when they should see war, they get disheartened and go back to Egypt. So he wanted his people to have two years, two years of uh, wilderness experience, not 40. But anyway, before we can go into the maturity, there must be the seasoning of all of us to just to prove the Lord that he will therefore do what he says. Now, here in the 12th chapter we read, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. This is what we call our January. And, and, and this is usually April the 1st. They shall take to them every man a lamb according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, remember they had at least 50,000 lambs, but they just call it singular lamb. Never does it say the lamb is too small for the family. But if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the souls Every man according to his eating shall take your account for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish. A male of the first year, you shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the houses wherein they shall eat. And they shall eat the flesh in that night roast with fire, and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs shall they eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs, and with the pertinence thereof, and ye shall let nothing of it remain unto the morning. There's enough of the lamb to go around, but God is not going to let it see uh, putrefaction. And it says, There shall none of it remaineth of it unto the morning, ye shall burn with fire. There's enough of the Lamb of God to spread all over the world. And if the whole world would believe in the Lord Jesus, the whole world would be saved. But God's not going to let it go begging, is he? Not at all. And thus shall ye eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. After they got out and a year passed, they were in the wilderness. Some men were defiled by a dead body. They came to Moses and said, Now we are unclean. Can we eat of the Lord's Passover? Moses says, I'll go and inquire. Ninth chapter of Numbers. And so we find out that he inquired of the Lord and said, Yes, he that is unclean may eat of the Lord's Passover, but the next month. Then God says this, And the stranger, the Gentile, may eat. Isn't that marvelous? God saying this as the Lord Jesus is our Passover slain for us, that they that are defiled can eat of the lamb. 
and says, and the strangers can eat also. Praise God that the Lord Jesus is our Passover. We Gentiles too, as well as the Jews. Then he said, but he that is clean and eateth not the Passover, he shall be taken out and slain. In other words, those people who are moral in their own eye, who think that they are not sinners, they are sinners. But they that are not defiled, if they eat not of the Passover, they shall be slain. And we say all the righteous people, all the moral people, unless they're born again, unless they take Christ as their Savior, shall go to their place where they're in the lake of fire, burning with fire and brimstone forever. Now, as we go here, we explain some of these things here. For years and years and years, Israel had the Passover lamb. Even the, the Samaritans still have it. But Israel has not had a lamb for nearly, uh, well, 1906 years. We find instead of that, they have a big lamb's bone. And this has been cooked like they do for hours and hours and hours to get all the marrow out. And any of the flesh that might be there, there's nothing left anymore of an Israel Passover of a lamb. And we can say this, the Lord Jesus is the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And without him, Passover is nothing but the ordinance of an old dry bone. That's all Judaism is without the Lamb of God. Here we have the bitter herbs. We have this as a horseradish, and here we have lettuce. And this is to speak of the bitter bondage in Egypt. Then over here we have the boiled eggs, and the boiled eggs here speak of the eye. And then we have here the salt water that speak of the tears that Israel shed for 400 years being the slaves of Pharaohs and the Egyptian. Now we find also in front of us are the, the three loaves of unleavened bread. And we'll go there in just a little bit to show you. Here we have three loaves of unleavened bread. One, two, three. They have been doing this for 3,500 years, yet they did not know the significance until the Lord Jesus took the bread and break it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Now we have four cups in front of the host of the Father, and then also everyone else. Therefore has a wine glass of their own. The first thing that they do as they begin uh, for the Seder, the Seder is here first, and this, and this is in two parts. When we go through this and eat of this, and then we have the regular supper, and then as it says this, and when they had supped, Jesus took bread. So there's two parts of it. First part we do here, then there's the supper, and then after that is the fulfillment of the rest of it. So therefore we begin, and everyone take up their wine glass, and we praise God for the wine. This is therefore thanking God for such a marvelous harvest and what he's done for us, and we praise God for the wine. Drink, drink you Now comes the passing of the bitter herbs. You may just take some help. Yes. Take some, please. Then the, then the lettuce. As the men, and I've been in their homes, they said, this is the one night that the father of the household is the king of his castle. This is the time when father directs everything. This is the time when everything hinges upon him and he directs everything. And how he prays God that he has this position of being the father of his household. You may eat now. And this reminds of us of, of our people, as we would say we Jewish people, of the great bondage that our people spent 400 years in rigor there under the pharaohs of Egypt. And God, this is one most wonderful thing, God heard our cry. <laughs> A horse race, you will really open up your sinus, as you will. I like this stuff myself. Yeah.
Now comes the time, the passing of the, well, first here, will you go see, see if he's come? Have you noticed that we have an empty chair here? Now, this has been added, of course, since the time of Moses, but the empty chair is for Elijah, and they send out one of the members of the family and ask, has he come yet? They're looking for Elijah. What do they want? Oh, every Jewish home would love to have Elijah come and bring the Messiah to their home. Wouldn't that be one? Oh, to have him to come. Oh, praise God. He's going to come for us one of these days very soon. Amen. And we're going to see him, and then he'll come back, and they'll have the Messiah. Oh, for a thousand years of that, and then forever and forever. Amen. Now, before we pass that, we take up the first cup. The first cup, we give God thanks. This is called the cup of sanctification. This is the cup that we thank God that he has given to us, we Jewish people, the, the title of the people of God, my children. I call my son out of Egypt. And we praise God that we are a sanctified, a separated peace, people. And God has said, Israel shall never be reckoned among the Gentiles. Whenever there is a Jew, he, when he therefore comes to America, he's American Jew. When he's there in Israel, he's just an Israeli. But when he's um, here in America, he's American Jew. When he's in England, he's an English Jew. When he's in China, he's a Chinese Jew. Even when he takes Christ as his Savior, he's a Hebrew Christian. And therefore, we find out it's marvelous, therefore, to be one that is so separated. And God said this, that Israel is, therefore, separated and set apart. And it is the cup that we drink, praising God that we Jews are there for a separated people. They pass. Now, at this time, we're going to pass the hard-boiled eggs. And this is a picture of the eyes, therefore, that shed the many tears that our, our forefathers for 400 years wailed they could hardly stand the rigor, the terrible things. You may pass the... The salt water that speaks of the tears. That's it. And just dip your egg into that. And this speaks of the many, many tears that our people shed, longing for Palestine and all for the hurt and the terrible things that they went through, the beatings and so forth. Oh, my. The salt water. Just think what they have had. Israel today can say, well, maybe they had it tough in Egypt, but look what we've had in the last 50 years. The next cup is taken. This is called the cup of blessing. There has been no people upon the earth that has been blessed as Israel. We find that Israel's father was a Syrian, that is, speaking of Abraham. And therefore, we find out this, that he himself was a Hebrew. He himself, the Jewish people say, he was a Goy. He was a Gentile. He was not a Jew. He was not an Israeli. An Israelite, because they all came from him. He is the grandfather of Israel, that is Jacob, and the great-grandfather of the twelve tribes. He is the father of them, but he is not, therefore, one himself. He is called a Hebrew because the word Heber comes from the word Eber, meaning coming across. He came across, therefore, the river Euphrates. And so this is the cup of blessing that he gave to one man, made him the richest of all men, I made him to have all blessings that all nations of the world will be blessed through him. And even through his seed, singular, Jesus, would everyone be saved. And we praise God for the cup of blessing. Will you go again, please? Just 
keep on eating. Don't you? Yeah, boy, that's great. Now, no one gets foundered on this part. This is not the real dinner. This is just getting ready for the other. Amen. <laughs> Good appetizer. Has he come? No. I don't see. At this time, I'm going to say I was about to get in the message in the home. I went through this orthodox home. I was just bawling and crying. I tell you, I could hardly stand it. Mrs. Cameron, Judy, myself, were the only Gentiles there. We were believers. There was one Jewish man, a believer. There were 12 unbelieving Jews. But did you know, in just the next few weeks, 11 of them trusted Christ as their Savior? And we, we went right from this and told them the whole story. This is so wonderful now. Here are the three matzah. In some way, they have, have them separated, but everywhere I've gone, they've had them all together. Now, you ask, and I have books after books, they all differ, but they said that these unleavened pieces, and you know leaven means sin, unleavened means sinlessness, that the first mean, therefore, the Levites, the second, the corn, and third, the children of Israel, but it was the Lord Jesus that night that takes it. Here you are. What does he do? said, this is my body which is broken for you. We know that the three speaks to us of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now watch this. They always take the second loaf, not the first, not the third, but the second. And they take it, and they break it. This is my body, which is broken for you. Bless his holy name. Then, see, Israel got the message. Then, after that speaks of his death, does not. Then they wrap it up in a napkin. And what this speaks of? our blessed Lord being wrapped in grave clothes. Then they go over. To a place like this, and they put it here. And they put a pillow over it. What does that speak to us? Uh, his burial. Now you may pass the real food. Now, the Passover supper is not over yet, but now here comes the real dinner, the Seder. It is. Now, we did it just a little bit, just Kentucky friend that chicken, you know, a few things like that. <laughs> Thank you. Not that a girl. Amen. The father gets the best. I get the, <laughs> the, the breast here. Amen. Really eat it. Now, you're going to have to bear with us a little bit, you know, while we eat some of it anyway. <laughs> Amen. I want to say this, that when I went to, the, I never ate so much in my life. It took us two hours. What a time. Amen. I like it. We'll come back to this after this is over. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody's having a wonderful time praising the Lord that our people did come out of Egypt, that God did separate them and gave our people blessing and still blessing our people. And we're praising him for all of these things. What a wonderful, wonderful God we have. And we just praise the Lord that our family can be here at this time. And we just praise God that we can do all this now. You see our brother here? Now he's going over there and he's going to take it away. Now during the big supper, I was waiting for the, the youngest child to get it, but I didn't see it. 
I guess I got so interested in the good food passed by. <laughs> but the youngest always goes and gets it. And when we get through here, then we see the significance of all of it. I'm doing pretty good myself. <laughs> Take another bite and then I go good. swallow again. There you and when they had supped, the Lord Jesus took bread. Where's the Alpha King? It's gone. What does that speak to us? Resurrection. Amen. He's not in the tomb any longer. Has anybody seen the Alpha King? Where's the Alpha King? Anybody seen the Alpha King? We can't get on without the Alpha King. Oh, he's got the Alpha King. Oh. Well, son, give me the Alpha King so we can go ahead and do it. No, it's mine. But, well, son, we can't get along unless we have it, you see. Uh, we got a lot to do yet, and so you better give it to me. No, it's mine. Well, have you any idea what you'd like it to, to, uh, to sell it to me for? <laughs> <laughs> Everybody won't see. I heard one man, put, uh, one lady rather, put her child up and says, a new car for mama. <laughs> uh, what, what do you want, son? I want a trip to Israel at Christmas time. Uh -huh. Amen. A uh, trip to Israel at Christmas time. Come and join us, okay? <laughs> right, now, here you go. Son, if you give that to me, I promise to give this to you at Pentecost. Now, get this. When they observed Passover, who was the youngest member of the group? John. Who wrote to us of that? John. What did the Lord Jesus promise? what they would receive, the gift of what at Pentecost? The Holy Spirit. And the first chapter of Acts, the Lord Jesus had been with them 40 days. And as he, he was going with them up there upon the mount, he says, you tarry in Jerusalem until you receive the promise of the Father that you've heard by me. Amen. Okay, you'll have that. Now, here it is. This is my body, which is broken for you. You see, you do not eat of the Lord Jesus when he's alive. Neither do you eat of the Lord Jesus by faith when he is slain on the cross. But you can only eat of the Lord Jesus in salvation when he's been raised from the dead. Amen. Now, will you have a piece there? you have a piece? you have a piece? You have a piece? Okay. It's taken after everybody served. And they put it into the highest part of the house. What does that tell us? His ascension. Amen. Wherefore he is able to save to the uttermost them that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for. Him. Now it's time to take the third cup. The third cup, translated into English, means judgment. He took the cup. No doubt he drank the other two with his disciples. This cup he did not drink, but gave it to his disciples. And what did he say? Now, this is a cup of judgment. He said, this cup is my blood of the New Testament, of the New Covenant. Where was it to be shed? On Calvary. It's a cup of judgment because God had made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. 
There's a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stain. There is going to be a fountain, says the book of Zechariah, the 13th chapter, for all the inhabitants of Jerusalem and Judea, the fountain open for cleansing. Oh, yes. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is the cup of judgment. And you may, as the Lord Jesus says, this is my blood of the New Testament, the new covenant. You may drink this, as the Father says, if you wish. Take a sip, pass it on. Now at this time, they begin to extol the Lord. They begin to see which one can tell of the greatest way God has blessed them in the past year or the past years. And they begin to exalt him and praise God that they are the people of his and the sheep of his pasture, and they praise God for it. And then as one goes on, what a glorious time it is now. You'll find we have the fourth cup. For these many hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, the fourth cup has been left. We're told this, that they sang a hymn and went out. But this third cup, while the Lord Jesus did not drink it there, I know he prayed an hour each time for three times. Three hours he prayed, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. Not the cup of death. He knew he was going to rise from the dead. But the cup of judgment. Father, can I not redeem man without becoming a curse? Do I have to go to a cross and be cursed by my own law? Father, we've been together for all time and eternity. Why do we have to be separated now? Why do I have to be sin what my holy soul has therefore hated from all eternity, but nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Three hours, an hour each time, our Lord pray. The cup, the cup, the cup. Not the cup of death, but the cup of judgment. So we're told this, that the Lord Jesus fulfilled, and, and they do too. They all stand, and they sang a hymn and went out. That leads us in some kind of song we little. Uh, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. as you eat this bread and drink this cup remember when you're taking the Lord's Supper you're taking that second loaf that was broken that was wrapped in grave clothes and put into a tomb but raised the third day ascended up on high but often as you eat this bread and drink this cup and that cup that you drink on the Lord's Supper is the cup of judgment that our blessed Redeemer has drank. Shall we go? Leave then. And they sang a hymn and went out, but they leave the fourth cup. For years and years and years, 
that cup has been left there. Some Jewish people here in America will say this, next year, Jerusalem. That's not in the ritual, of course. Next year, Jerusalem. But you know what? When you speak to the Jewish people there in Jerusalem who are Orthodox, you say, what, what about the, the Passover? You're in Jerusalem. What do you say now after ever Passover? They say, next year, the temple. But the fourth cup, why is the fourth cup left? It is called the cup of communion. The Lord Jesus said this to his disciples after they had drunk of the third cup. He said, the Son of Man will not drink of the fruit of the vine till he drinks it anew with you in his Father's kingdom. How long are we going to eat of the second bread, Monsa? How long are we going to drink of that third cup, till he come? No, we don't go by signs, but that's one of the greatest signs he's going to come again. As often as we do, we're saying he's coming again. And when he comes, we will not have the Lord's Supper anymore. We'll not eat of that third, of the second loaf, nor the third cup. I can just see the Lord coming back. I know he's going to do it. He said he would. After he judges Israel, purges them, and then he judges the Gentiles, he's going to get with his apostles and say, listen, we've got some unfinished business. Amen. Go to that upper room again. If it's not there, we'll build one. Amen. Amen. And therefore, we'll drink the fourth cup. No more of the other three. Praise the Lord, we'll drink of the fourth cup, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Amen. So, thank you. Thanks for listening to Make It Clear and to today's special guest, Dr. Mark Cameron. My name is Stan Pons, and I'm your host and president of Florida Bible College. If you'd like to know more about Florida Bible College and how it has classes on campus, online, and even on site, please visit our website at floridabiblecollege.com. That's floridabiblecollege.com. We're also very grateful for all those who support Make It Clear. It's through your prayers and financial support that we're having such a local and global impact with the truth of the gospel that so clearly states salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. Well, if you've trusted Christ as your Savior and you would like to be a part of helping us get this message out to others, you may send your gift to Make It Clear, Post Office Box 607-901, Orlando, Florida, 32860. That's Make It Clear, Post Office Box 607-901, Orlando, Florida, 32860. Or you can go to our website, makeitclear.org. That's makeitclear.org and use the secure donate link. You may also request your free devotional called The Word for You Today. Well, thank you so much for listening today and be back next time for Make It Clear. You're listening to Make It Clear with the teaching of Dr. Stan Pons, founder of Make It Clear Ministries and president of Florida Bible College in beautiful Orlando, Florida. Make It Clear is dedicated to taking the Word of God with clarity into every person's world. It is the support of listeners like you who make the ministry of Make It Clear possible. You can provide your tax-deductible gift to Make It Clear online by going to makeitclear.org. Or you can mail your gift to Make It Clear, P.O. Box 607-901, Orlando, Florida, 32860. Thank you for helping us Make It Clear. If you would like to have Dr. Pond speak at your church or event, please send us an email at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. Thank you, and remember to make it clear.